Welcome to the Architect's Possibility Podcast with David Bradley of Blueprint for Living Coaching. Each week, we connect with design professionals, just like you, who are using their creativity, leadership, and passion to make the world a better place in ways both big and small, every day. Now, here's the host of the Architect's Possibility Podcast, architect and executive coach, David Bradley. Good day, everyone. Welcome. I'm so excited today. I've got the wonderful opportunity to be speaking with architect Tom Bonnier. Uh, Tom is an architect, a fellow with the American Institute of Architects, a member of the Royal Institute of British Architects, and currently president of the International Union of Architects, the UIA. Um, he's also a former past president of the American Institute of Architects. The UIA is a global organization, for those of you who don't know, representing the world's 3.2 million architects. And um, in his capacity as the AIA president, Tom is also representing 95,000 uh, members of the American Institute of Architects. So Tom, welcome. Thank you Thank so you, much David. for joining me. It's Thank really you. great to have you it's here. A pleasure. You know, I'm so excited to have you here because specifically in your roles uh, as president of the International Union of Architects, you have your pulse on the heartbeat of the profession, I think, not only based on your national experience, but also globally. And in the current times that we're in, a lot of confusion, a lot of fear, a lot of unknown, I'm curious what you might be able to share with us about how architects around the world have been handling the pandemic. Well, thanks, I, uh, David. It's wonderful to be with you and to see you after some time. We know one another and uh, yeah. ha have, have some acquaintance. Um, well, I think they are handling it. And uh, one of the remarkable things about our profession is the um, sort of uh, common interest we share across national boundaries and ethnic and cultural and even economic boundaries in seeing how the built environment relates to uh, the social milieu that we're in and uh, right now, of course, the, the pandemic. And I think one of the things that I see um, in, in the architects all over the world is a recognition that uh, the physical environment plays a great part in uh, both the propagation of this virus and in uh, helping to uh, combat it. Uh, uh, we're seeing a great interest now in natural ventilation and in being sure that indoor environments are, are properly filtered and um, have access to clean air because we're understanding more and more about how this uh, virus is spread mm -hmm. in indoor environments. And so I think you know, apart from human behavior and the way people behave, the most critical element of this right now is what what role does the environment play in um, in uh, this this pandemic that we're all experiencing? Of course, it, it's created difficulty for people all over the world. It's it's disrupted plans, as we've been talking about, and. Um, I think people have changed, in a sense, uh, their priorities and, and what things they're focused on. Uh, and that includes architects, uh, just like everyone else. Um, the UIA was created in a time of real need, global need, uh, in 1948, about three years after the Second World War. Uh, its first president was a man named Auguste Perret, who was a sort of the godfather of reinforced concrete. And he personally was responsible for rebuilding a couple of French cities, including Le Havre, which had been badly damaged, in fact, leveled by uh, Allied bombings during the war. And so it's an organization that was really created um, in this belief that architecture and design could make a difference in human affairs and could help improve things. And I think, mm -hmm. That has been our watchword now for some 72 years, and, and it is uh, that today. You currently have, I believe, well, it's representing 3.2 million architects. It's kind of a, a mind-boggling number of people yeah. who are active all over the world. What sort of, from that pool of people, what kind of initiatives have you seen that have arisen as a result of the, um, the pandemic? Well, again, I'd say there's commonality and, and there probably have been three principal uh, thrusts uh, in, in just about everywhere. And uh, remarkably, one of, one of our most active uh, 
member sections is South Africa, which has had a great deal of experience with this uh, across many different types of settings, everything from informal slums to the sort of most developed uh, settlements that you can have. And I'd say, first of all, and first and foremost, it's um, an attempt to help uh, institutions, uh, principally health institutions, cope with large numbers of people who need assistance and medical assistance. And early on and now again, uh, developing in many parts of the world, were massive influx of patients to hospitals uh, needing care that hospitals were not really prepared to provide for mm -hmm. those numbers of people. So emergency facilities, number one, and especially emergency facilities where isolation of patients is possible. Um, and um, that, you know, ICUs are not equipped to handle the numbers that are being seen in many parts of the world, including the United States today. And so that's one thrust. I'd say the second has to do with um, creating uh, environments that allow distancing, physical distancing between people uh, and the creation of environments that allow lines and, and spacing of individuals so that they can keep the, the distance that uh, medical professionals think is required. And then third, as I touched on before, I think uh, an emphasis now on looking at how indoor air quality uh, is maintained and how uh, this can be um, maintained in the interests of avoiding further infections. It's, it's really, it was crossing my mind as you mentioned sort of the rethinking of space. I mean, architecture by definition is the creation of gathering spaces. Yeah. And of course, in a pandemic, we're actually being told not to gather. So there really has to be this yeah. complete topsy-turvy rethinking of what does it actually mean for us to congregate in a built space? Um, sorry, go right ahead. There, you you know, there, is, some, there is some um, good in all of this, I think, in a sense that um, we are evaluating other ways of meeting and interacting, just as you and I are doing right now um, mm. in a digital environment and across across the airwaves. And I think in a sense, perhaps rationalizing some of the, the business behaviors that, that we've had over the years and, and coming to terms with new opportunities uh, through a new set of demands and, and requirements. Uh, so it's, um, I think it is true that we will be forced to um, change the way we gather for the foreseeable future. I think even if there is a uh, a proper vaccine uh, or several vaccines, even if there are treatment protocols that, that are successful, I think we're in this for uh, some period of time mm -hmm. and it will, it will require us to adapt. And uh, we also have to remember that this is just one uh, coronavirus and, and it's likely we will see others even in our lifetimes. And so I think all of these uh, accommodations are something that we'll, we'll have to be living with for, for some time to come. And uh, I believe clients and organizations across the world are looking at that. I know that one of the things I was hoping to do this year that sort of got put on the back burner, I was hoping to attend the... Uh, UIA conference in Rio. Yes. And I do know that unfortunately that got postponed until June or July of next year. July of 2021. Yes. So as president of that association, I mean, right there is an example of how an initial concept of how we gather and how we meet had to be, it basically got derailed by the pandemic. That's right. Curious moving into next year, what sort of shifts or transformations are you all considering Sure. based on this conversation, right? Yeah. It's, we're really rethinking how do we gather yeah. 15,000 people to get together in one place? Well, David, that's the right number. That is, a, that is approximately what uh, would have been present for uh, the World Congress of Architects. In Rio, we had uh, something on the order of 14,000 in Seoul, Korea uh, in 2017, and then mm. in Durban, South Africa, and Tokyo before that, uh, uh, slightly fewer. Uh, that's more, mainly a matter of geography. Mm -hmm. um, there is still an enormous appetite for meeting together and coming together and 
um, that's in a sense almost irrepressible. Um, and you see it, you see evidence of that everywhere, right? <laughs> Paris, you know, uh, you, yeah, they have to close the cafes to keep people out of them. And, and um, you know, there's just a human appetite for gathering and for associating. And I don't think that will, that will diminish. Uh, so uh, I'm hopeful and many people are hopeful that we will have a significant turnout in Rio in the middle of next year. But we're also recognizing that uh, through digital means and by perfecting uh, presentation methodologies and by perfecting the mechanisms that we use to transmit uh, live events, we can involve more people than would have mm. been possible. And, I, and so we and others, including the American Institute of Architects and many other organizations are looking at hybrid events at, at ways to uh, project beyond uh, the physical gathering, but without uh, losing that. And, and I think, um, you know, many, many uh, organizations have taken steps already to try and have safe, safer gatherings. And uh, I expect that will continue and will be no exception. Has the program changed in any way as a reflection of our new circumstances? I'd say we're in the middle of that right now with our mm -hmm. colleagues uh, in Brazil. We're, we're still working. In fact, we're meeting next week virtually to go over some of the plans. Um, and I, there will be changes. I have no doubt about it. And uh, I, I think those will be for the better in a sense because um, we have no choice but to recognize the circumstances that we're, that we're in. Right. Um, Brazil, uh, of course, has faced its own challenges, um, and especially Rio de Janeiro. Uh, one of the great attractions of that city is that it has all of the sort of challenges and, and um, promises of the 21st century. You know, it's a city of millions upon millions of people. Uh, about half of them live in uh, pretty impoverished circumstances, uh, many of them in squatted settlements, uh, favelas, uh, in, in places that um, where, where distancing physically is not really not even a, a possibility. People mm -hmm. live in very close proximity. And so it's a, it's a place that presents, let's say, different issues than Washington, D.C. would present uh, in terms of accommodating um, tourism, uh, accommodating um, the problems that, that communities face uh, in this pandemic. You've certainly faced a major road bump, let's say, or speed bump in your presidency because of the pandemic and this having to shift everything to move it yeah. on. I, I really commend you for taking it on. Well, thank you. Um, outside of the pandemic, what other big issues are facing architects globally? What did the profession and individually? Well, I, I'm sure many of your listeners will be familiar with the uh, sustainable development goals of the United mm -hmm. Nations. There are 17 of them. Um, it is really a, a set of uh, aims and goals and aspirations that represent uh, the closest thing we are likely to see uh, to an international agreement about how to overcome the problems of uh, poverty, injustice, uh, ill education, hunger, uh, mm -hmm. lack of shelter, all of the issues that plague our planet of, of seven and a half billion people. Uh, and I think uh, architects, not uniquely, but I think in a, in a very special way, have embraced these goals as an expression of um, what we have to do in order to achieve a planet that is um, equitable for all people and uh, healthy uh, from an, uh, the standpoint of um, regenerating resources and, and keeping people healthy. So everywhere I go, and I, you know, despite the pandemic, um, I, ha I have a three-year term of office, which has now been extended to a fourth year because we've been okay. unable to hold elections. For three of those years, I've traveled all over the globe, really, literally, uh, to every continent and to many, many countries. And I'm uh, always uh, amazed to see the, the level of um, agreement and sharing of, of aspirations among architects. Uh, and I think these 17 sustainable development goals uh, of the UN and UN Habitat uh, express very well uh, what, what people want to achieve and hope to achieve. Um, 
And, and now I, I understand sustainable is becoming a, a hackneyed word, a very familiar word, and everyone is using it, but it still uh, expresses, I think, um, a hope that we can achieve development and uh, live in, in a manner that is um, kind to the environment and good for people, for all people, uh, regardless of, of uh, stat stature and life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think um, conservation of resources, trying to shift from uh, uh, non-renewable energy sources to renewable energy sources, trying to build with materials that are not as harmful to the environment. All of these elements are, are part of what architects almost everywhere are, are trying to, to enforce and, and to achieve. Um, that's one. I think the other is that um, we understand this profession is changing in a number of ways. Um, and many of these are trite ideas, but you know, that's because there's truth to them. Uh, it is a team enterprise. The architect is no longer the master uh, in charge. Uh, and uh, the, the digital revolution has created a number of opportunities and challenges for our profession uh, that really change the way we produce our work, uh, the way we document our work, and the tools that are available to us as we design. Uh, and I, I see evidence of this all across the globe, even in the lesser developed countries, which in a way have leapfrogged some of the, some of the phases through which uh, the developed world has has had to go through. Sure. I, I've had much the same experience when I've traveled abroad, speaking with other architects, that yeah. there is this a, a unity of vision um, and very many shared goals. In your conversations, what would you say, well, I'm curious if you think there is also maybe a, a unity of the hurdles or the challenges that we face? When architects come to you, what stands in their way most, most typically? Well, I, I think everywhere there is um, government and uh, everywhere there are politicians who control purse strings that affect how public buildings are built, uh, architects, um, share the conclusion that design and quality of buildings is undervalued. Uh, there are many exceptions, but I think as a general rule, um, there is pressure in the political environment to produce buildings cheaply, quickly, mm -hmm. uh, and without sufficient regard for the long term and the quality of what is built. Uh, so some countries, uh, France would be an example, have adopted a national design policy, a, a genuine expression of the cultural sustaining value of building, and have tried to uh, make sure that public investments are made in a manner that uh, fulfills the expectations that, that people should have of the built environment, that design quality is high, things are built to last, uh, they're built uh, to enhance human life. Uh, not simply to fulfill a, a functional purpose, but to do to do more than that. And I think architects everywhere um, complain uh, about the lack of sympathy for design quality, uh, about the lack of resources being spent on design quality, which does uh, entail some expense. And they lament the fact that development takes place in a manner that is not environmentally sensitive uh, and doesn't really serve the interests of all people very well. Uh, and I, I, it's interesting, David, to go, even a place like Nairobi, Kenya, which you know has one of the world's largest uh, slum populations and is a, mm -hmm. is a place with, with a great deal of need and, and uh, difficulty, you find uh, suburban developments that are almost indistinguishable from what you would find around Houston or uh, for that matter, uh, around um, a city in Germany. Huh. Uh, you, 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 you see these patterns of the de development that are totally dependent on the automobile that enforce a, a sort of um, road system and way of life that uh, is, is the same across uh, 
boundaries and doesn't really uh, serve anyone very well except the economic interests of the people who build them. And uh, I, I think many architects have tried to grapple with how do we develop urban environments in a way that is less harmful to the environment, easier to negotiate for more people, and um, something that is a, we can embrace for the future and not simply a, a sort of expedient way of dealing with the present. Right. What then, in the face of these challenges, what do you see as some of the solutions? Uh, some things that I could imagine might be uh, more political activism within the architectural profession. Sure. Um, yes, of but course. I'm not sure what else I might see. Well, I, I like to um, point out the work of, of a few architects in particular. Um, I think Alejandro Aravena from Chile is one who has accepted the idea that uh, many people in society are going to build for themselves. I, I would estimate that's more than a billion people in, in the world who build for themselves wherever they can scavenge materials using whatever they can right. uh, find a, a, at whatever time they have to build. And he uh, is an architect who, who for um, Chilean uh, copper miners, who would have basically been living in squatter housing, designed a very elegant sort of basic infrastructure that allows uh, the dwellers to build for themselves over time uh, with materials at hand, but that has an underlying stability and, and service um, apparatus that works very well. So it's not just political activism because there's the design ingenuity involved and there, there's, this, there's a, a contribution that only a person who is a designer could make to understanding how an environment can be made better uh, through simple gestures. Uh, another one is Francis Quere from Africa. Um, he is from um, uh, Burkina Faso, grew up in a very small village there, but was a bright man and became educated in Germany as an architect. Mm -hmm. But he has, in a different environment, also uh, recognized that people will build for themselves using materials at hand. So he's done a, a, a number of very interesting schools and clinics and now dwellings uh, using indigenous materials and uh, having people build for themselves, but uh, employing techniques that only a designer, uh, only a skilled architect, and, and, and in fact, a gifted architect would be able to, to devise. And so I think, yes, political activism is important and, and being engaged with the political operations is, is important, but I think also uh, there is a contribution purely to be made by design to some of the issues that are most pressing for our globe. Well, and it also sounds like a very sensitive understanding of place. Yes. And, and the people who occupy it. It's not I think that's right. I was struck by the difference between the example that you mentioned in Kenya and the example in Chile, where it sounds like in Kenya, this basically a one size fits all cookie cutter. Uh, development model has basically been plunked down without reference to the culture, the environment, the space. I could have chosen right. anywhere. Uh, it's you know, that's just one one place that you wouldn't necessarily expect True. to see that kind of development. This is an off the off the wall question, but it just dawned on me: um, Are architects universally considered a white hat profession? Has that been your experience? I think so. I think um, well, if by that you mean we're the good guys and we're- Yeah, but basically yeah. I'm thinking held in high esteem and seen as the people with the answers. Uh, I'm not sure about the last. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was, yeah. yeah. Um, what I do think, David, is that um, generally they are seen as people who have um, the ability to bring creative energy to something and to create mm -hmm. something that doesn't exist yet. Uh, and beyond that, we have this enormous gift of being able to convey uh, a vision or showing people how something might be. Uh, and not right. everybody is able to do that. Um, right. You know, and, and that's a wonderful 
power to have if it's used uh, correctly. I think, um, you know, uh, there, there's a good friend of mine uh, who became, he was president of the RIBA in England, and then he became mayor of a, of a major city. I, I won't mention his name, okay. um, but I remember him saying that um, now he understood why mayors hated architects because <laughs> he became a mayor. They were the most difficult people he had to deal he was with. On, he was on the receiving yeah. end of it, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. And, awesome. and so, you know, I, I don't think, uh, uh, White Hat, I'm not so sure. And, and you know, of mm -hmm. course, um, there is a there is an element in society that regards um, modern architecture and architects as uh, abhorrent. You know, I mean, remember the Prince of Wales calling the the addition yes. to the gallery a, a carbuncle, and, and you know, yes. there is definitely a, a sense that architects do things that are inappropriate and unsuitable. Um, right, uh, and, and you know, that's that's out there too. I, I love that. You know, it's funny too, when you mentioned about uh, architects bringing a creative energy and showing people something. One of the reasons that I started doing this podcast was because I've always maintained trying to find the nexus between my coaching and my architecture careers. So that architects are uniquely qualified to create possibility where none currently exists. I think that's true. And I think coaches do the same thing. So it's sort of seem to me like the perfect marriage of the two. What are the possibilities coming up with uh, the International Union of Architects? Oh, I, I think um, we're, this is a, this is a by now an institution that has survived for, for a while. And, and um, you know, I think the, the great challenge for us now will be to attract the next generation of leadership. Um, and I think every institution uh, is going through this in one way or another, a transition in leadership. Uh, most of the people who are in positions of uh, leadership in, in this organization and in many organizations that I see are, um, let's put it this way, in, in the third stage of life, if, uh, you know, not, not in the early stages, but uh, in the latter stages of life. And I include myself in that. And so yeah. I think you know, now um, we, we grew up in an era where belonging and organizations like the AIA uh, were important. And that's less true, I think, today than was the case. And yet there's a great need for association. I, I believe truly in the power of association in uh, our ability to do more uh, as a group than we can do as individuals. And so I think UIA, like every other organization, has to attract people who are uh, committed to doing things out of a sense of service and opportunity. And um, so we're looking for uh, young men and women who will come to the UIA, stand for office, and, and be a part of the organization. Um, it's wonderful to see, uh, you, you mentioned before we started recording, um, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the Malaysian Architects Organization is a very dynamic and active group of people, and I have never seen such an energetic group of young people take over an organization and do so much with it, and it's wonderful to see that happen. Uh, and they've been encouraged by their elders. I mean, it's it's not like the old, old guys clinging to power and position. No, they're saying, come on in, you, you can do this, and, and uh, it's just wonderful to see, and I, that's I hope what's what will happen with UIA in the coming years uh, right. fervently. It sounds like there's a bright future for the organization. I there. hope so. I think so. It's, and it's for the profession. Needed. Yeah. yeah. How, I, I, I think sorry, so. sorry, go ahead. I, I think there is. I, you know, uh, you, you uh, mentioned this ability uh, to, to create vision. Um, another architect I'd mentioned, uh, and he is not universally uh, revered, is Bjarke Ingels. Um, I, you know, the big B-I-G has been able to capture the imagination of so many people and particular people in positions of political power. Hmm. And um, I, I think of the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the scheme they did for the southern end of Manhattan, which had uh, been so badly damaged uh, during Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the proposals initially by the Corps of Engineers, of course, was to build a huge concrete barrier against the <laughs> sea. And, uh, you know, 
you, you saw how well that worked in New Orleans. Right. And, uh, you know, I think Engels, um, through his vision and his ideas, was able to invent this idea of the big U, uh, a different scheme, which basically treated a zone between the water and Manhattan as recreational land when um, conditions were right, but as something that could be sacrificed when water levels Above rose. Her. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very successful. It's being implemented. And I think only an architect and only an architect with kind of a bold, uh, almost brash uh, attitude could uh, have brought this about um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of forced this vision through. Not all of what he has done is great or good, um, but I think it's an example of someone who uh, was able through creative force and simply the force of personality and, and uh, belief in, in what could be possible, who was able to try and change the, the course of events for, for better. And um, I think that's a, a great story for architects and for architecture. That's excellent, very instructive. And I can imagine across the entire membership of the UIA, you've got hundreds and thousands of examples of people who, uh, who are bringing that kind of imagination and vision. To, I think, I think to that's right. And uh, yeah. one thing I would commend to your listeners, uh, our, um, our Danish counterparts in Copenhagen have produced a guide to the 17 sustainable development goals. It's available online. If you look up architectural guide to the UN sustainable development goals, you will find this book. It's now it's in its second edition. It's available free of charge in PDF. Okay. And it, uh, for every one of the 17 goals, it uh, illustrates projects from all over the world that respond to those goals and documents those projects. And it's filled with wonderful examples of just what you've mentioned, uh, architects who are doing great work. I will be sure to add that into the show notes on my blog so people can get that as a Good. resource. Good. How, does, how does one get involved with the UIA? Well, it, it is a, an organization... Uh, of organizations. So we don't okay. have individuals who belong. It is the national uh, professional bodies who belong to the UIA. In the case okay. of the United States, it is the American Institute of Architects who belong. Right. Okay. So if one is active in one's national organization and one gravitates to that part of the organization that deals with international affairs, uh, that's the proper way to do it. Um, different organizations have different ways of identifying people to, to put forward or to nominate for office. I right. was very fortunate that AIA backed my, my candidacy for president and very fortunate that I won uh, by a huge margin, by the way. Excellent. <laughs> I'm Excellent. always happy to boast about that. <laughs> Especially on the eve of the election. I think that's well, a great yeah, thing. Yeah, I'll say. I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> that's, hopefully yeah. the polls that were predicting your winning were accurate. So. Yeah, let's, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I will say this. You know, the United States um, has a checkered, uh, let's say a checkered position on the global stage. And mm. um, we're not... Uh, universally liked. Um, and so for an American to be elected to the presidency of this organization is something. Um, it's, a, it's a big thing. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking the same thing, similar to the UN in many respects. Well, it is. It, yeah. And uh, if you went to one of our general assemblies, uh, they're held only every three years, in this case, it'll be a four-year interval. It looks like a UN meeting. I mean, there, I can are, there are national blocks. Uh, the, there are four official languages. Everyone is wearing a headphone to, so they can understand what a, someone who's speaking a language they don't under, understand is saying. And it is very much like a UN. Well, and that's one way that people can get involved is they can join me down in, in Rio in June. Yes, attending. July. Uh, uh, sorry, in July. July. Uh, July uh, and watch for it. Um, you can find it on the UIA's website. Uh, very easy to do. I will put it in my calendar. It's going Absolutely. to be a wonderful event, I have no doubt. Tom, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak my with pleasure. me today. This has really just been an enjoyable conversation about the future of architecture, the global impact. And um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Be well. Uh, see you in Rio, if not before. Absolutely. I've got Great. my plane ticket. I'll get it done. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, David.
Thanks for joining us this week on the Architects Possibility Podcast with architect and executive coach David Bradley, produced by Blueprint for Living Coaching. If you found value in the show, be sure to give us a rating on iTunes and share it with an architect you know. Remember to tune in next week for our next episode of the Architects Possibility Podcast. Until then, keep celebrating the possibility in your life and make it a wonder-filled day. Thank you.